never known the Lord turned to him. So I rejoice greatly that we could all have a part in these meetings. It is the word of God, the word of Christ, that makes us ministers and believers. The story is told of the Emperor Napoleon. One day, as he was reviewing his troops, riding along on his white charger, his horse suddenly took fright. He reared dangerously and jerked the reins out of Napoleon's hands, and the Emperor of France was in momentary danger of losing his life. In front of him was a solid wall of infantrymen, trained to standard attention, presenting arms. As the horse raced down past this line of men, one of the privates, disregarding all discipline and order, threw down his musket, leaped forward out of the line, grasped the flying reins, and brought the horse to a standstill. Then he handed the reins back to the hand of the emperor, who said, Thank you, Captain. The soldier, standing there in the plain uniform of a private soldier, said, Of what regiment, sire? Of my guards, replied the emperor. Then the young man left the line, started off across the field in his old, muddy infantry uniform with no hat, to join the group of officers over on the hill at staff headquarters. They looked askance at him. Finally one said, What are you doing here? He replied, I am captain of the guards. Captain of the guards? Whatever makes you think you're captain of the guards? He just pointed to the emperor who was riding by and replied, He said so. It was not the uniform. It was not the sword. Not the cap or hat. But the word of the emperor that made him captain of the gods. Oh, friends, that living, eternal, creative word of Christ makes us ministers of his, makes us believers in him. Thank God for that holy word which lives in the hearts of men. It goes on not only to live there, but to beautify and change and bless the world through them. Years ago, a noted infidel died. At least people thought he was an infidel. They thought he was an unbeliever. He had been an unbeliever for many, many years. But several years before he became ill, and it was quite clear that the end was near, his life had been changed. His friends had argued and prayed and talked with him, but all to no avail. They thought he was hopeless and said so among themselves. At last someone just left a little Bible there in the sick room, and when no one was looking, he opened the book. He began to read in the Gospel of John. He read about the lovely character, the fairest of ten thousand, the Holy Savior. After a few pages, he became interested. After a few chapters, he was convicted, and then converted. Before he finished the gospel, he was in love with Jesus. He gave his heart to him. He died professing faith in Christ the Lord. A few days later, after he had gone, they found on a slip of paper in this Bible that had changed his life, the words of a little poem that he'd written, a poem of his own experience and of his own composing right out of his heart. I've tried in vain a thousand ways my fears to quell, my hopes to raise. But what I need, the Bible says, is ever only Jesus. My soul is night. My heart is steel. I cannot see. I cannot feel. For light, for life, I must appeal in simple faith to Jesus. He died. He lives. He reigns. He pleads. There's love in all his words and deeds. There's all a guilty sinner needs. Forevermore in Jesus. Though some should sneer, some should blame, I'll go with all my guilt and shame. I'll go to him because his name above all names is Jesus. We find our text this afternoon in the 24th chapter 
of the book of Exodus, the twelfth verse. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, and be there. And I will give thee tables of stone, and a law, and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. Notice, friends, tables, law, commandments, all three names given in this order of truth, which God had written. And Moses was commanded of God to come up into the mount, the Mount Sinai, where the Lord would give him a law and commandments written by God on tables of stone. Moses was to take these commandments down from the mountain and teach them to the people. They were to be placed in the holy ark, in the tabernacle, in the most holy place, and to be the center of Israel's worship. Now, just what did happen? Well, Moses was up on the mountain a long time, forty days and forty nights. The Lord gave him some other instructions, explanations of these commandments. And he was there that long period of forty days and forty nights without food or drink through the power of God. Now we turn to Exodus 32, beginning with the 15th verse. The forty days are past, and Moses turned and went down from the mount. And the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides. On the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. And we might add that the commands thereon written were the commands of God. And when Joshua, and Joshua was with Moses, he was not right in the presence of God with Moses, but he tarried nearby, and when the forty days were up, he was there to go down with Moses. Joshua was the military leader of the great migration of people from Egypt. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There's a noise of war in the camp. Now, if you've read the preceding verses, and the ninth chapter of Deuteronomy along with it, you will find that while Moses was gone during these forty days, the people had entirely turned around. They had gone back on their promises and fallen into idolatry. When God spoke the Ten Commandments from the top of Mount Sinai, the people heard it, were terribly frightened, and asked God to let Moses talk to them afterward, talk to Moses first and tell them, and God agreed to it. And then they promised that they would keep those commandments. They heard the good Lord speak them. Now they have turned around. Here they are, people who have seen the mighty work of God in bringing them through the Red Sea, and giving them manna every day to eat. The pillar of fire was on the tabernacle every night, and the pillar of cloud by day. They could see it. This just shows that miracles alone will not convert people. And here they have turned completely around in a public apostasy, just as soon as Moses was gone for a few days. This standard of their life, the holy commandments they had repudiated, they went back in their public promise in a public apostasy, and you remember that Aaron made a big collection of jewelry from the people, not for foreign missions, not to pay the preacher's salary. He did not collect it to be used in the service of the true God. But the women brought in their earrings and metal looking glasses, and they were melted down and made into a golden image, a sacred bull or apis of Egypt, called here a calf. And they began to worship that heathen idol which they had known in Egypt. And they danced around it with the lascivious dances of pagan worship. The Bible says they sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And that word play has very ominous meanings. While Moses was coming down from the mount with the holy law of God in his hands, the people were breaking the very first command of that law. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And they were breaking the second command, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. They had done that. They were bowing down to an idol, and by doing this they were breaking all the commandments, of course, but especially the first two. Here was God's nation, people who were especially delivered by him from bondage, a people upon whose name was called, God's name was called publicly defying God, 
and committing these flagrant sins as a nation, as a people. What happened? Let's go back to this 32nd chapter. Moses was coming down from the mountain with the commandments, the tables of the law in his hand. He and Joshua were together. And when Joshua heard the noise of this great celebration, this heathen feast they were celebrating in honor of their idol, the first thing he thought about was that their enemies had attacked the camp and war was on. Joshua heard the noise as they shouted, and he said, There's a noise of war in the camp. But Moses replied, It's not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. That's verse 18. The people were singing the pagan song of idol worship. And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh into the camp, speaking of Moses, that he saw the calf, that is this golden image of the bull god Apis, and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot. His anger grew out of the sin of the people. The sin of the people in worshiping this idol caused Moses sanctified anger for God to wax hot. And he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mountain. This was a symbol that their covenant with God had been broken. They had promised God to keep these commandments. As a nation, they had seen it signed in the blood of a sacrifice. And they accepted it. And here they have broken God's covenant. They have broken his commandments, so their covenant with God is broken. Their marriage ceremony with the God of heaven has been broken, and they are divorced spiritually. And what did Moses do? Then he took this calf, this idol, which they had made, and burnt it in the fire, and ground it to powder, and strawed it upon the water, and made the children of Israel drink of it. Verses 19 and 20. I used to wonder how he could grind up gold and put it in water and make an emulsion so the people could drink it. Because gold always goes to the bottom, you know. It's heavier than other minerals, heavier than the sand, and goes to the very bottom of the river, wherever it is, or in any vessel where it might be. I've seen men panning gold. In fact, I learned how to do it myself when I was a boy. My grandfather taught me how to do it in the mountains of Colorado. Gold always goes to the bottom of water. But according to chemists, you can make an emulsion of gold and water if you know how. You burn the gold in a certain way, just right. And then you agitate it violently when it's melted. Grind it very small, very fine, and mix it with water. And many times it will make an emulsion. One man in the United States, I understand, is able to do it and make an emulsion of gold and water exactly looking like blood. It's blood red. Possibly that's why Moses compelled them to drink this. I understand that the taillights of the old Model T Ford car, so very red, those who've seen them remember them, they were made with a gold emulsion. Moses had the tables of stone with the words of God written upon them. He had been in the presence of God on the top of Mount Sinai, and in that divine presence, the presence of the God of heaven on top of the mount, and then in that divine presence he received these words. They were inscribed upon the tables of stone, and he brought those tables of stone from the very presence of God down the mount to where the people were at the base of the mountain, and then the stones were broken. What caused the breaking of those stones? What really caused the breaking of those tables? Well, when Moses came down from the mount, he saw the people dancing around the golden calf. He saw them committing this terrible sin. He beheld this awful apostasy. Turn with me to the ninth chapter of Deuteronomy, verses 9 and 12, and here we find the story. Moses tells it himself, When I was gone up into the mount to receive the tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant which the Lord made with you, then I abode in the mount forty days and forty nights. I neither did eat bread nor drink water. And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God. And it came to pass at the end of forty days and forty nights that the Lord gave me the two tables of stone 
even the tables of the covenant. And the Lord said unto me, Arise, get thee down quickly from hence, for thy people which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They are quickly turned out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten image. And the Lord said to Moses, Let me smite them. Let me blot out their name. But Moses prayed for the people. He pleaded, Lord, remember thy name among the nations. In the 15th verse, we read how the mount burned with fire, symbolic of the wrath of God. Moses said, The two tables of the covenant were my two hands. And I looked, and behold, ye had sinned against the Lord your God. And I took the two tables and cast them out of my hands and break them before your eyes. He tells then, and tells us clearly, of fasting a long time before God and praying. He fasted forty days and forty nights before the anger of God was turned away. Now there are two times he's fasted that long period. This last time in praying for the people and interceding before God. It was the sin of the people that broke, broke those stones, really. We say, what was it that really broke the two tables? Why, the sins of the people, of course, wasn't it? Had the people not sinned, the tables would never have been broken. Therefore, the sin of the people, that great public sin, caused the public breaking of the Ten Commandments when they were shattered to bits at the foot of Mount Sinai. Remember, Moses came from the top of Sinai where God was, down to the base where the people were. And the sins of the people broke those tables. Well, after the people had gone through their purification, we'll not go into that in this sermon, and the sacrifices had been offered, and Moses had prayed and besought God for forty days for the people, interceded for them, so that he would not destroy the whole nation. What did the Lord tell Moses to do? We go back now to Exodus 34, verse 1. The Lord instructed Moses to make two new tables of stone. Moses was to make these tables of stone. God made the first tables, but Moses made the second tables. And here's what Moses himself says in describing it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first. And I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. Now keep in mind, for we are coming back to it, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. God promised to do that. The fourth verse tells how he did it. Moses cut out two tables of stone just like the first and took them up to God on the mountain where God dwelt. And God wrote on the second table the words that were on the first table. Friends, did you ever stop to think what Moses had to do before he could make two tables like the first? Well, Suppose you were in Moses' place, and there were those broken pieces of stone, all broken and scattered about at the foot of the mountain, among the stones. They were crushed, some of them, lying at your feet, different shapes, different sizes. And God should say, now you must cut out two tables of stone just like the first. What would you have to do, first of all? Well, you'd have to get down on your knees and patiently, carefully pick up all those pieces, every one. Isn't that right? Certainly. You'd have to pick up all the pieces and put them together in order to get the proper and exact dimensions, the length, width, thickness, shape, etc. And I imagine Moses spent a good deal of time down there on his knees, studying each piece to find where it belonged, how it fit in. He knew the shape and size of every piece before he was through. Bending over, trying this piece and that piece, picking up these broken pieces, fitting them together. It was a big task, a humble work, a humiliating work, a back-breaking work. It was knee work. But he finally got the pieces together, and all the measurements taken. And then he had to find some stone, like the stone of the first tables, and go to work with a chisel and hammer and cut it out from the ledge, smooth it off, and prepare it. I often think what a job that was, and carrying those heavy tables of stone to the top of Mount Sinai. It wasn't a notebook job. It wasn't an office job, I'll tell you. It was a great burden physically, even if the stones were rather small, to carry them up to the top of that mountain. I climbed up Mount Sinai once, and it was all I could do to carry myself up. 
In fact, with one other person, we were at the very end of a whole line of climbers. Mount Sinai is just a few feet under 8,000 feet high, and the base of it is the same as the height of Denver, between five and 6,000 feet. It's a rugged mountain. There's only one tree on it, and that was planted by man about five or 600 years ago. How Moses could carry those tables to the top of the mountain. No wonder the Bible speaks of his strength, even when he died over a hundred years of age. His natural force had not abated, the Bible says. Now, with all this in mind, let's turn to the New Testament and see if we can find a wonderful picture there which comes back to Mount Sinai and answers the question, who really broke the sacred heart of Christ? But first, let us read the prophecy in Psalm 40, verse 7 and 8, which said, Lo, I come, or behold, that means look, I come, I am coming. In the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, yes, thy law is within my heart. Does that refer to Jesus? Does it? You say, well, I think it does, but does it? Let's turn our Bibles now to the 10th chapter of Hebrews, and you'll find that the apostle here applies this very scripture to Christ. So it is talking about Jesus, who, when he came into this world, had the will of God or the law of God inscribed on his heart. Now, let's turn to another text. Here it is, Proverbs 3. You'll find that this word table is applied to the human heart. In other words, it's a place where things are written the heart of the mind. It's where the memory does its work. I read here in the third verse, bind them about thy neck, that is, God's commandments. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Write them upon what? Upon the table of thine heart. Write what? The commandments. That's what it says there in the third chapter of Proverbs. Then you remember other places in the scripture, Second Corinthians 3, 2 and 3, for instance. The apostle says that Christians are epistles, are letters, written not on tables of stone, referring to the Ten Commandments being written on tables of stone, but on the fleshly tables of the heart. The same glorious word of God and will of God is holy commandments. In the Christian's life will not be written on tables of stone, but on the very tables of his heart by the Holy Spirit. And they become not commands, but a promise. Instead of commanding us to keep the Sabbath, for instance, it's a promise that we will keep it, because we're now God's children. The same thing, it was written on the tables of stone, but the finger of God is written by the Lord through his Spirit on the tables of our hearts. So there the heart is spoken of in the same way as are the Ten Commandments as tables. And when Jesus came to this world, he said, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written to me to do thy will, that is, to do thy commandments. For thy law is within my heart written upon the tables of his heart. When Jesus came here, the holy word and will of God was written on his heart. And when Jesus came to this world, true, he was born in Bethlehem. He was born there as a babe. He entered the human race there, but he didn't begin there. Jesus came from heaven. Where did he come from? He came down from heaven, from heaven where God dwells, where God works, where God lives, where his throne is. We know, of course, that by his spirit, his presence, God is everywhere in the whole universe. But there is a center which he calls his home, which the Bible calls heaven. And Jesus came from heaven where God was, down to this world with the law of God written in his heart. From that place in the very presence of God, Jesus came down to this earth where men are. He came from God, the holy, righteous, eternal God, to man with all his sins. And he brought from God to earth the tables of God's law written in his heart, or God's law written on the tables of his heart. He came from the place of divine splendor and holiness and purity and light to the place of evil and darkness and sin and death. And there he died upon the cross, put to death by wicked men, But it was all in God's plan. He was dying for these wicked men. What killed Jesus anyway? Was it the Roman nails driven through his hands and feet that killed him? No. 
Men who were crucified often lived for three or four days, even a week, and died of thirst and hunger and pain. Was it the spear thrust into his side? No, he was dead before that was done. Was it the crown of thorns that killed him? Was it the crucifixion that killed him, the sickness on the cross? For he was desperately ill, caused by all these things that happened to him. Days and nights of suffering, fasting, mistreatment, a terrible scourging, and all the rest of it. What killed him? Let's see if we can find it by looking in two or three Bible texts. First in Matthew 27, verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. At the very moment of his death, he cried with a piercing cry. In fact, it was a great cry of victory. Keep that in mind. One of the things that happened at his death was this piercing cry. One word in Greek, tetelestai. That means it's finished. It's sealed. It's completed. It's certain. He had won the victory. And his death was for the atonement of the whole world and the defeat of Satan. For he came to destroy the works of the devil, which is sin. And he came to destroy the devil too, which will take place in due time. Now let us take another text. This time John 19.34. One of the greatest chapters in the world. This is very important because John himself draws attention especially to what he saw take place there at the cross. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. Two distinct streams, note. If it had been mixed together, it would have looked like blood. But this was blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. There was something about this that would help us to believe. It was very important to John to make it clear that Jesus died on the cross before they came and pierced him. Now, those two thieves were still alive. These soldiers had an order to come and break the legs of those three men and take them down from the cross because the Sabbath was about to begin. And in those cruel times, if men were crucified and had not died before sunset, they came along with a hammer or crowbar and broke their legs so they could not run away and took them down from the cross and left them lying on the ground in the cold of night and put them up again after the Sabbath was over if they were still alive. What a cruel and terrible age that was. But when they came to Jesus, the Bible says, and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. And this fulfilled the prophecy made nearly a thousand years before, a bone of him shall not be broken. And the apostle John witnessed this very thing. He saw it, and he bears record of it that we might believe. So Jesus was dead. Now, there's something important about this, these two things, the cry at the moment of his death, and the blood and water from the spear wound prove, we're told, that Jesus died of mental anguish. He died of a broken heart. What caused his heart to break? What caused the mental anguish? What caused the bloody sweat in the Garden of Gethsemane? What caused the agony of Christ? Let's have a text or two on that. You know these scriptures, but let's read them again. Here we read that wonderful text in Isaiah 53, that thrilling messianic chapter which pointed forward directly to Christ, points to him as the sufferer, and not only the sufferer, but the victorious sufferer, a sufferer for the sins of others, an innocent sufferer. We haven't time to read the whole chapter. The last 27 chapters of the book of Isaiah form a great cantata, a song about the Messiah. It's divided into three sections of nine chapters each. And the central section of the nine chapters has for its central chapter this 53rd chapter. And in the very center of the 53rd chapter is this verse, like a beautiful ruby pane in the rose window of the cathedral of eternity, the messianic prophecy of Jesus. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. 
the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Isn't it wonderful? I once read of a young lady who was worried about her spiritual condition. She couldn't understand how God could forgive her sins. An old minister told her to read this chapter. And when she came to the fifth verse, to substitute the first person singular pronoun for the plural form, and then, when she got through reading the chapter, to see if she couldn't understand how God could forgive her sins. But he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. And then she stopped. And a wonderful light came into her eyes as she read, And with his stripes I am healed. That's it, friends. When Jesus died of a broken heart, it was the sins of the world that killed him. Isn't that true? Doesn't the Bible say it in First John 2, verse 2, that Jesus died, quote, for the sins of the whole, W-H-O-L-E, the whole world. It uses that very word. He died for the sins of the whole world. So if he died for the sins of the whole world, he died for my sins. Had the sins not been there at the cross, then he need not have died. He died for every sin of every person that ever lived from Adam to this hour, and who will live until he returns. Therefore it was the sins of the whole world, your sins, my sins, that broke the heart of Jesus. You and I are part of a sinning world. But Paul, the great apostle, says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That being true, I ask you today, who broke the sacred heart of Christ? We did. You did. I did. The Jews did, the Irish did, the French did, the English did, the Russians did, the Dutch did, the Germans did. People of all races, all lands, all colors, all conditions killed Jesus. We were all there at the cross with our sins. He laid our sins on Jesus, the blessed Lamb of God. He bore them all and frees us. From the accursed load. Let us not be like Clovis, the great warrior king of the Franks, who, when he stood and heard the priest tell about the crucifixion, said, Had I been there with my brave Saxons, they never would have killed him. I wouldn't have let them kill him. But just the same, he had a part in killing Christ. The nailing of him to the cross was a mere incident. Christ would have died of a broken heart somewhere, somehow because the sins of the world were upon him. My sins were there. I had a part in it. We had a part in it. We broke the sacred heart of Christ. Can't you see the wonderful parallel here as Moses came down from the presence of God there on the top of Mount Sinai? The sins of the people down at the base of the mountain and danced about the golden calf broke the tables of stone. But Moses brought them down who himself was a type of Christ. So Jesus came down from heaven with the heavenly Father's holy will in his heart, from heaven where God dwells, and down here to this earth he came as one of us and walked the dusty paths of Palestine and lived as we lived. He ate, he drank, he slept, yet he was a God-man. He was God and man. And finally, up Calvary's rugged hill, he climbed and bore the sins of the world, our sin. Our sin broke his heart. But the story doesn't end there. Moses made two tables like the first. He got down, picked up those pieces, looked at them, compared them, studied them. He measured them, contemplated them. Then he cut out new tables like the first. God said, bring them to me. And I will write upon them all the words of the first tables. So today the Lord says, Son, give me thine heart. Proverbs twenty three twenty six. He wants you and me to bring our hearts to him. Of our own free will. All broken. We've broken every one of the Ten Commandments. 
He wants us to study the life of Jesus. He wants us to study that broken heart. He wants us to look at the pieces of that holy love of God written on the tables of Jesus' heart. Study the life of Christ. See his holy perfection. And the more you see his holy perfection, the more you'll see your own imperfection, your own unworthiness. And then you'll fall before him and you'll say, Oh God, I'm a sinner. I've broken the heart of Christ. I've broken every one of these commandments because the Bible says if I'm guilty of one, I'm guilty of all. I'm a sinner. I confess my sins. I accept your promise. But whosoever will confess with his mouth the Lord Jesus, that Jesus took his place, that Jesus is my holy Savior that died for me. It was my sins that broke his heart. He's already borne my sins, Father, and I come to thee in his name. Forgive me. Give me a new heart like his heart. Right on my heart, everything that was on his heart. That's what we need to do. And that's what I'm asking you to do this afternoon. Look at the heart of Jesus. Study him. As you go to the Bible, you'll find a little here and a little there. A picture here and a picture there. Study the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Read the epistles of the great apostles. Read the wonderful prophecies of Isaiah and the other Old Testament prophets. Friends, the more you study, the more you'll see the beautiful heart of Jesus, his wonderful broken heart, his loving heart, his burning heart, the sacred heart of Christ broken for our sin. And as we see it more and more, we cry out to God for help, the help we need. We need to drink at the fountain, open in the house of David for sin and for uncleanness. We need to feed upon the blessed word of God. And the more and more that we need to come to the foot of Mount Sinai, yes, to the foot of Calvary's cross, and there bring our lonely, broken hearts. Oh, friends, the Scripture says we need to come to the rock, Christ Jesus, and be broken. He that falls upon this rock shall be broken, but he upon whom it shall fall will be ground to powder. Matthew twenty-one forty-four. We must come and be broken on the rock, Christ Jesus. Our proud hearts must be broken, for pride is the greatest sin in the world, spiritually speaking. And when we come to Jesus and bring our hearts to him again, and on our knees study his life every day, and ask God to write his holy law, the very heart of Jesus, upon our hearts that we brought to him, he does it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Ah, yes, through prayer and faith we can take that heart. Right up to the place where God dwells, he will hear our prayers. And God will write on a new covenant relationship. All the words that were on the first tables that were broken. Jesus' heart was broken for our sins. His life, his mercy, his righteousness will be ours. Written on our hearts by the Spirit of God. Not only forgiveness and justification, but sanctification and righteousness. All of Christ will be ministered to us by the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven. Friends, that's a privilege of every Christian. And we can hear the words of Christ ringing in our souls, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is in my heart. Who broke the sacred heart of Christ? We did. But, oh, thank God, as Israel of old, we have an opportunity to come to that cleansing crimson wave as they came and drank the water and the gold. They had Moses as their mediator. He pled for them and saved them as a nation. We have Jesus as our mediator who comes and saves us as individuals, intercedes for us before God. We have an opportunity to come and bring our hearts to him and have wonderful words of peace written there by the Spirit of God. That we shall be like him, for by beholding him we become changed. We become his children more and more. That's what God wants us to do. And that's what he wants to do for us. And that's his call to us this afternoon. I do desire to have the work done in my heart. I wish to bring my heart to him today so that he may write those words there. It's a wonderful privilege to have faith in God. Remember the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon his name shall be saved. But how can they call on him in whom they have not believed. And how can they believe if they have never heard? 
And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring good tidings of good things. And friends, that's what we're bringing you today. Good tidings of good things. A minister once traveling in a far western state came to a home where children were deaf and dumb, were being cared for, all together as a state project. He went there to speak to them. Its words were translated into their sign language. He also wrote things on the blackboard, and the children would go up and write the answers. He wrote various things about God on the blackboard, and then, I don't know how he could be so cruel, it seems that way to me, but he wrote, If God loves you, why did he create you deaf and dumb? There was a great silence over the whole place. Not a hand went up. Those little afflicted children just bowed their heads and cried. Finally, one little girl stood up and went up to the blackboard, a little breast heaving with grief as she took a piece of chalk in her hand. And what do you suppose she wrote under the question? These are the words she wrote. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Matthew eleven twenty six. Oh, friends, may we have that kind of childlike faith which can trust the Father, believing the Father that he knows what's best, that out of every anguish, every dark night, every heartbreak, he will bring joy and a bright day in the future. I wonder what our response is to such an appeal today and now. Who broke the sacred heart of Jesus? Oh, we admit we had a part in it. Yes, but are we willing, are you willing to study that part that we've had? Are you willing to study it in the Gospels and in the Epistles? Are you willing to see it there and see your need and measure your need and contemplate it and upon your knees study it? Are you? Then ask God to give you that heart, a heart like Jesus. And write on it all his will and all the righteousness that was on Jesus' heart. If that's what we need, wouldn't it be a fine thing to have a real revival of desire and to seek God here in a positive way this afternoon? I believe there are many here in this meeting who ought to make a decision like that and bring their hearts to God and have the Holy Spirit write on them the things that ought to be written there. Thank God he can wipe off the things that ought not to be there. He can erase them forever and give us a new heart and a clean heart and a holy heart and a righteous heart. New tables of the law written not with pen or ink or chisel, but the Spirit of the living God. Not on tables of stone, but on the fleshy tables of the heart. All written by his truth and his word through the Holy Spirit's ministry that whatever we do will be done from a new heart. Even the heart of Christ implanted in us by faith and by the Holy Spirit's power. O oh Lord our God, this afternoon we pray that Thou wilt receive everyone. Thank You, Lord, for those who are standing, those who come forward, and here with bowed heads are confessing their sin. And reach the boys and girls and the young people. We thank Thee for the ones that are still coming. Remember those that haven't the courage to come. Heal them where they are. Remember those we're praying for in the homes. We're not here today. O oh Lord, send a mighty revival. Not of excitement, but of deep conviction. And lead us, we pray, in the way everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen. This has been another classic sermon from the Archive of American Christian Ministries. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette or reel-to-reel in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International copyright, American Christian Ministries. All rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations, or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 800-233-4450. 
International calls down 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministries.org. There you will discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. You can trust ACM. There is no compromise here. If American Christian Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony? We'll share it with our speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He's coming soon. <laughs> 